Salco. Salco is indicted on all four counts. Salco joined the Nazi party in 1923 and became Gauleiter of Syringia in 1927. He was a member of the Syringian legislature from 1927 to 1933. He was appointed the Reichstadthalter for Syringia in 1932 and Syringian Minister of the Interior and head of the Syringian State Ministry in May 1933. He became a member of the Reichstag in 1933. He held the former rank of Obergruppenführer in both the SA and the SS. Crimes against peace. The evidence has not satisfied the tribunal that Sarko was sufficiently connected with the common plan to wage aggressive war or sufficient, sufficiently involved in the planning or waging of the aggressive wars to allow the tribunal to convict him on counts one or two. War crimes and crimes against humanity. On March 21, 1942, Hitler appointed Sarko plenipotentiary general for the utilization of labor with authority to put under uniform control the utilization of all available manpower, including that of workers recruited in bro abroad and of prisoners of war. Sarko was instructed to operate within the fabric of the four-year plan and on March 27, 1942, Goering issued a decree as commissioner of the four-year plan transferring his manpower sections to Sarko. On September 30th, 1942, Hitler gave Sarko authority to appoint commissioners in the various occupied territories and to take all necessary measures for the enforcement of the decree of March 21, 1942. Under the authority which he obtained by these decrees, Sarko set up a program for the mo mobilization of labor resources available to the Reich. One of the important parts of this mobilization was the systematic exploitation by force of the labor resources of the occupied territories. Shortly after Sarko had taken office, he had the governing authorities in the various occupied territories issue decrees establishing compulsory labor service in Germany. Under the authority of these decrees, Sarko's commissioners, backed up by the police authorities of the occupied territories, obtained and sent to Germany the laborers which were necessary to fill the quotas given them by Sarko. He described so-called voluntary recruiting by, I quote, a whole batch of male and female agents, just as was done in the olden times for Shanghai. That real voluntary recruiting was the exception rather than the rule is shown by Sarko's statement on March 1, 1944, that out of five million foreign workers who arrived in Germany, not even 200,000 came involuntarily. Although he now claims that the statement is not true, the circumstances under which it was made, as well as the evidence presented before the tribunal, leave no doubt that it was substantially accurate. The manner in which the unfortunate slave laborers were collected and transported to Germany, and what happened to them after they arrived has already been described. Sauckel argues that he is not responsible for these excesses in the administration of the program. He says that the total number of workers, uh, workers to be obtained was set by the demands from agriculture and from industry, that obtaining the workers was the responsibility of the occupation authorities, transporting them to Germany, that of the German railways, and taking care of them in Germany, that of the ministers of labor and agriculture, the German labor front, and the various industries involved. He testifies that and so far as he had any authority, he was constantly urging humane treatment. There is no doubt, however, that Sauckel had overall responsibility for the slave labor program. At the time of the events in question, he did not fail to assert control over the fields which he now claims were the sole responsibility of others. His regulations provided that his commissioners should have authority for obtaining labor and he was constantly in the field supervising the steps which were being taken. He was aware of ruthless methods being taken to obtain laborers and vigorously supported them on the ground that they were necessary to fulfill the quotas. Sarko's regulations also provided that he had responsibility for transporting the laborers to Germany, allocating them to employers, 
and taking care of them, and that the other agencies involved in these processes were subordinate to him. He was informed of the bad conditions which existed. It does not appear that he advocated brutality for its own sake, or was an advocate of any program such as Himmler's plan for the extermination through work. His attitude was thus expressed in a regulation. All the men must be fed, shattered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent at the lowest conceivable degree of degree of expenditure. The evidence shows that Sauckel was in charge of a program which involved deportation for slave labor of more than five million human beings, many of them under terrible conditions of cruelty and suffering. Conclusion. The tribunal finds that Sauckel is not guilty on counts one and two. He is guilty on the counts three and four.